Valentino's second wife, Natasha Rambova, wrote the following in a letter to Jack Barrett of the Bollingen Foundation. She writes from Luxor, Upper Egypt, in February of 1947, and I quote, The material I was able to gather here was well worth the trip up, where for four hours I choked and smothered in dust. The fine white dust of Upper Egypt defies all precautions and preparations when the wind blows. Before leaving, we had a three-day Sirocco, which changed the weather and ushered in the real summer heat and dust. I had been told the only hotel in Aswan was the Cataract, which turned out to be a great morgue of a place stifling and declining magnificence, with prices in accord, with its rating as the most expensive hotel in Egypt. Arriving just in time for lunch, I was shown to the screened-off corner of a huge black dining room where a handful of intimidated guests were whispering their conversations. Not a ray of light entered until I asked if we might have a blind lifted and a shade pulled so that we might at least see the famed view up the river, which we were presumably paying such tariff to see. A young American couple, obviously on their honeymoon, sitting at the next table gave me a grateful glance and forgot to whisper. The food, like everywhere else in the place, was for show, to be seen but not eaten. Discovering a small but gay and refreshing hotel on the main street called The Grand, I went there later for tea, to fill up the emptiness left by the uneatable lunch. This little hotel is run by an Egyptian married to a French woman. It is spotlessly clean with good, simple, well-cooked food. I sat in a charming garden and made note of it for future use, as the rate's full pension are less than half that of the cataract. End quote. Today we follow Natasha Rambova to Egypt in the late 1940s, 20 years after the death of her beloved Rudolph. There we will find Madame Valentino leading an expedition into the Valley of the Kings in the company of two handsome and charismatic men. Who were these two men who, after that expedition, would dominate Natasha's life for the next 20 years until her own death in 1966? Ciao! I am Renato Flores, the proud publisher of all the scholarly and entertaining books on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova by Evelyn Zumaya. I'm here today with Evelyn to discuss more about her fascinating work. Ciao, Evelyn! Ciao, Renato! Today we delve further into the almost endless subject of Valentino's second wife, Natasha Rambova. Oh, the mere mention of her name generates such a furor in the Valentino world. Some folks appreciate her role in Valentino's success, even giving her all the credit for making him the star that he was. And these folks recognize the artistry of her fabulous Art Deco set designs and those lavish costumes, such as those in Valentino's movie Monsieur Beaucaire, as just one example. They see her as a fashion icon and a woman far ahead of her time. While others, while they seem determined to dismiss her importance and undermine the validity of her marriage to Valentino by blaming her for everything from their divorce to his early death. These Rambova naysayers delight in exacting some sort of vengeance and calling her a harpy and a cold bitch who was ever so hateable. Today, I hope to shed more light on who Natasha Rambova really was, and in doing this I will focus on the two men who worked with her in Egypt and who would be her others, shall we say, during the last 20 years of her life. I think it is unfair and superficial to judge Natasha Rambova by her marriage of a few years to Valentino, when she was then so very young, in her 20s. Who really has their lives together in their 20s? I personally say almost no one. Uh, she lived 40 years after Rudolph Valentino's death in 1926, and learning about the rest of her life certainly reveals a great deal. I feel it is relevant and important to grant this woman her historical accuracy in the Valentino world, because this is to date where she is most remembered and talked about. And I will say, sadly, not so much in a good way. 
I hope to change that or in the very least expand the discussion. We have devoted four episodes now to the marriage and divorce of Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova. Uh, yes, we've covered quite a bit about her life with Valentino, Renato, and I hope listeners who have not already done so will listen to those episodes. One can speculate forever about what Rambova's future would have been had Valentino lived. And in my book, Astral Affairs Rambova, I claim Valentino and Rambova, despite their divorce in January of 1926, reconciled just before his death the following August. I sourced my claim from the testimony of those who were with her in France at the time. They recalled how Rudy and Natasha were exchanging cablegrams throughout the week before he died, and plans were being made for his recovery. This was confirmed in our latest book, The True Rudolf Valentino, by Balthasar Fernandez Cuey, the book you just translated, Renato, and made available for the first time in English. Cuey was writing this book when Valentino died and working with Valentino. And Cuey also writes about the exchange of cablegrams between Natasha and Rudy and their reconciliation. So if Valentino had lived, of course Natasha's life would have taken a different path. But that is not what fate had in store for her. But I think that it is in looking at her life after Valentino, particularly her love life, as I commented a few minutes ago, that we really get to know more of who this woman was. In the past couple of years, you spent a lot of time researching the life of Natasha Rambova. I sure did, Renato. Uh, of course I knew about her years in Hollywood, her relationship with the Russian dancer Theodore Koslov, her history as a set and costume designer in Hollywood, and her marriage to Rudolf Valentino. I believe I learned more about her divorce from Valentino than anyone ever had to date. From those court records I discovered and George Ullman's 1975 memoir, so much new information was revealed. For example, I learned what really happened on the day of that infamous parting scene at the train station. People are fond of looking at that last kiss shared between Rudolph and Natasha as she boarded the train for New York and believe this moment to be bittersweet and romantic, sad yet meaningful. I learned there was a lot more going on. In actuality, they were both furious with each other, and she had just come from a meeting uh, where she signed away any involvement in Valentino's affairs. So I knew a great deal about this specific time in her life because I wrote all of this into Affairs Valentino. But I would learn there was much, much more to know about the woman at Valentino's side. Uh, or as someone called her the other day in a conversation, her, uh, his sidekick. But despite all I thought I knew, in 2016, fate sent me back to Natasha Rambova Academy, and I would engage in my second intensive course in her fabulous life. This would come about through my friendship with Michael Morris. As I wend this narrative on towards that expedition into the Valley of the Kings, I offer a bit of explanation about how I came to learn all I did about those two men of her later years. The story goes like this. I was so honored to have had Michael Morris as a close friend for almost 20 years. For those of you who do not know, Michael Morris was a priest, a Dominican friar, and he was also the undisputed world scholar on Natasha Rambova and the author of his iconic bio, Madame Valentino, which was published in 1991. I contacted Michael early in my Affairs Valentino research sometime in 2002, and we found we then lived about 15 minutes away from each other. We became fast friends over our topics of Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova, and Michael would then become instrumental in making so many things happen in my Valentino research. He was my wise and thoughtful mentor and introduced me to collector Bill Self, granted me full access to his vast archive, was tireless in answering my years of questions, and in 2009, Father Michael Morris, uh, he sponsored my trip to Turin to deliver the speech which would change my life forever. He also introduced me to you, Renato. And so Michael Morris and I, and us, I can say, forged our own history as friends and collaborators. Michael read early drafts of Affairs Valentino many times over the years before the book's publication, and his suggestions were almost always taken. 
and he was endlessly supportive as I came under attack from the Valentino cultists. I am contemplating publishing my email exchange with Michael Morris, or some of it, uh, because he imparted so much great thought and insight on both Valentino and Rombova that I think they could be of interest. Well, at some point, and this was, I think, around 2012, 2013, Michael began talking about publishing a compendium as an addendum to his Madame Valentino in order to share more of his Rombova archive. When he first published Madame Valentino, his publisher put restrictions on the number of images he could include, and he was disappointed that the book was not in full color. So we began musing over the project. By then, I was publishing your books, and Michael Morris asked me to publish his new book, Beyond Valentino. He and I were friends for more than 20 years. I met him when I worked on the documentary Lo Sguardo di Valentino in LA. Lo Sguardo di Valentino means the Valentino glance. And this was the beginning of our long and happy friendship. Uh, yes, it was. So Michael sent us his outline for his sequel to Madame Valentino and I began organizing photos for him and acting in the role of editor. We did not work so consistently on the book, but by 2014, he was in contact with a gentleman in Majorca who discovered a remarkable cache of photos and artifacts which Natasha left behind in her Majorcan home. So progress on his great book was being made. But his mighty Rambova opus number two was, I would say, about three quarters of the way finished by 2016 when it would become my sorrowful and sole effort to finish his work. I excerpt from the introduction I wrote in Beyond Valentino. And I quote, Michael was emphatic this book not be just another Natasha Rombova biography. His goal was to present a compendium of archival material, primarily photographs, along with introductory essays, sufficient to grant coherence to the project's overall presentation. Above all, he wished to focus on Rombova's scholarship and showcase her unpublished writing. He lamented that although he received permission to publish these works in 1991, his publisher felt the materials too lengthy to include in Madame Valentino. Our initial efforts included the exchange of hundreds of emails as we debated how best to present the disparate elements or miscellany he wished to include. We designed several preliminary book covers, devised an outline, and began to organize Michael's enormous archive of correspondence and photographs. Our work remained sporadic until the spring of 2016. It was then Michael received a terminal diagnosis. He wrote to tell me the unthinkable news, and without pause turned to the subject of the completion of this book with a, quote, times are wasting. Despite the obvious challenges, we resolved to work diligently, depending on his physical well-being. By the end of June, this book was moving towards completion, and due for publication by the end of 2016 in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the publication of Madame Valentino. On July 8th, I sent Michael an email with news I would soon forward a revised cover design. He responded with a brief email saying, Great, wonderful. Those were his last words to me. Seven days later, on July 15th, Michael Morris passed away. I knew he was gravely ill, yet I expected some sort of recovery, extended treatment, uh, a little more time. News of his sudden death hit hard, and during the ensuing days of mourning, the fate of Michael's beyond Valentino remained in question. In September, I traveled to Berkeley, California to meet with his family and his literary executor. They made the decision that I would complete Michael's last work. Shortly after this meeting, I received his entire magnificent Rombova archive. It was then I realized Michael had left me the seeds with which to plant and nurture to fruition his beautiful garden that had been his dream for 25 years. As the contents of those unwieldy boxes of files unfolded, discoveries were made, new directions and research were required of me, and unexpected twists and turns rendered the task before me overwhelming." End quote. And so I dedicated one year of my life to completing Michael Morris's research and his book, and in the process I learned a great deal more about Natasha Rombova. After Michael's death, 
I negotiated a new contract with the superiors of his diocese. So Michael Moore's book could finally be a reality. Now that presented some issues, I will add. As you know, Michael was adamant I'd be credited on the book as editor from the earliest days of the project. I had zero plans to do any such thing. Because my name appearing anywhere on the book would ignite the torches of the team of Valentino cultists who would do everything to swarm the book with their lies and ruin sales. Uh, they would greet the news of Beyond Valentino's publication by flooding the internet with the same ilk of aggressive lies that they had served up with the appearance of every single book we published. But Michael Morris did not care. He told me that we could not, and I quote, let the Devil's Brigade control our lives, end quote. So Michael's diocese wanted my name on the book as a co-author, and I believe for them it was a question of liability. So I took a deep breath and pressed on, and one year after Michael's death, Beyond Valentino was published. I guess I could say that while I was on my way to discovering more about Natasha Rumbova's time in the Valley of the Kings, I discovered a great deal of other new information about her life after Rudolf Valentino. And in completing Michael's research, I discovered some things I think he would have been thrilled to know about. I followed his leads, poured through his archive, uh, and several times, and worked upon his direction, I feel, uh, anyway, to discover the following. I learned pretty much all there was to know about Natasha's personal companion and psychic George Weiner, who was at her side for the first few years after Valentino's death and who conducted those nightly private seances for her. While writing about this treacherous time in her life in Astral Affairs Rombova, I located the son of a close friend of George Weiner's. Weiner actually introduced his parents, and he was generous in sharing Weiner's history and, and oh photographs. I learned Natasha Rombova made a movie, which then no one knew about, and which was not listed in her current filmography. This is lamentably a lost film to date, titled Who Am I? Natasha appeared in the movie with a distant cousin of Rudolph Valentino's, Cassio, and I was able to add this last movie to her filmography for the first time in Astral Affairs Rambova, which I was very proud to do. I discovered the real reason why Svetoslav Rurich, Natasha's first love interest after Valentino, why he broke off his engagement to her. I learned this from a member of the Spanish Rurich Society, who sent me transcripts of Helena Rurich's personal diaries in which she wrote about her son and Natasha Rombova. As Svetislav's mother, it appeared she felt it her duty to protect his karmic identity when she told him Natasha Rombova was the reincarnation of Bathsheba, and she insisted he terminate the relationship and join the family in India. Michael always believed it was Papa Nicholas Rurich who demanded his son break off the engagement with Valentino's widow. How Michael would have loved to have read those excerpts from Helena Rurich's diaries and learned that Natasha Rombova was dumped for a past life as Bathsheba. I learned more about Natasha's life on Mallorca in the 1930s while living there with her second husband, the Spaniard Alvaro de Orsaiz. I read her essay titled Up Spain or Arriba España, which stands as a riveting account of her life there and her harrowing escape from the Spanish Civil War. This essay is published for the first time in Beyond Valentino. Now I add that at the time of his death, Michael Morris was actively researching these aspects of Natasha Rombova's life with the goal of including all of his new discoveries in Beyond Valentino. And he lamented to me many times how he regretted not divulging the love affair and engagement of Natasha and Svetislav in Madame Valentino and he became determined to set this straight in the new book. He told me that he agreed to the wishes of the Rurich Society when they requested in 1991 that he not write about the engagement of Svetislav Rurich and Natasha Rombova. But by 2009, Michael was determined to right the wrong, and this was when he wrote his speech delivered here in turn at the Valentino Conference. His speech was titled, The Woman Behind the Myth, the artistic influence of Natasha Rombova in the creation of the Hollywood legend. And he was determined to expand his Rombova scholarship by sharing more about her love life. 
In 2009, as he delivered his speech here, he was just pondering the further research he hoped to conduct into Rambova's Egyptian years and those relationships inspired by her expedition. And this brings us to those two men I mentioned in our opening. The tall, dark, handsome, and incredibly talented artist Mark Hasselris and the distinguished pipe-smoking Russian Egyptologist Alexander Pienkov. And so, as you know, Renato, with Michael's final research left undone by his sudden death, I would be the one to head off to Rambova's Egypt to hopefully make his dream of Beyond Valentino come true. I think it was interesting how you located Mark Hasseri's family. Yeah, uh, Yes, that was fairly random and incredible. Uh, it came about this way. Michael Morris was in contact with Mark Hasselrus in the late 1980s. Mark died in 1999. Uh, Michael Morris and Mark Hasselrus shared an extensive correspondence. This while Michael was researching Madame Valentino. They corresponded by phone a few times, and I know they met on at least one occasion. But mostly they communicated by long handwritten letters. And so Mark Hasselrus, the man who lived with Natasha Rombova for 20 years until her death in 1966, shared a lot with Michael. I have those insightful and entertaining letters and referenced them heavily in the completion of both books, Beyond Valentino and Astral Affairs Rombova. Now in one of those letters, Mark wrote to Michael saying he would be visiting family and he gave the name and address of the family member in case Michael wanted to write him there. This was 1990. Well, you know me, I had to try. And I set out to track them down, and I did. I found that family member, a nephew, and he was extremely happy to contribute to the story of his Uncle Mark. And he and a few of his relatives shared images and other letters from Uncle Mark. Uh, This obviously was an incredible source. And in delving into Michael Morris's archive, I found letters written between Natasha and Alexander Pienkov. And reading their correspondence so very much was revealed. Uh, By the way, their correspondence is housed in the Bollingen Foundation files in the Library of Congress. And I add that the Bollingen Foundation, which I will be mentioning here, funded Natasha Rambova's Egyptian work and the 1949 Alexander Pienkov expedition into the Valley of the Kings. So between these two great sources, the Hasselris family and Pienkov and Rambova's letters, what a story came to light. Now, this woman, Natasha Rambova, who still commands a huge presence online as a Hollywood icon, whether you choose to believe it was because she was married to Rudolph Valentino or not, this woman who seemed to vanish from Hollywood at the height of her fame, she went on to live another 40 years. And she did not exactly settle down in some cozy cottage with the shady elm trees and the white picket fence. Not at all. She was outrageously adventurous, ambitious, and seductive. And I found she lived her life with as much passion during those last 40 years as she had while married to the great lover Rudolf Valentino, no doubt at all. Now Alexander Pienkov, or Alex, as she called him, and Mark Hasselris were concurrently Natasha's main men for the last 20 years of her life. Alexander Pienkov was married the entire time to his wife Helena, who was Italian by birth, and she lived primarily in the Pienkov's apartment in Paris. Alex also had homes in Cairo and New York City. Mark Hasselrus was not married, and he was 27 years younger than Natasha, having been born in 1924, when Natasha was still married to Rudolf Valentino and working on Monsieur Bocaire. As I completed the research for Michael Morris into this time of Natasha's life, I became mesmerized by this powerful triumvirate of talent and intellect. How knowledgeable and worldly was Pienkov. How dashing and talented the brooding Mark Hasselrus. And Natasha Rambova, as glamorous as she was, even in her academic attire. How romantic and creative all three of them. And the thought of those three living and working together along the banks of the Nile, in Cairo, in Luxor, in Aswan, in the Valley of the Kings, is a romantic Natasha Rambova story itself of high drama. I reveled in reading their letters about the fights, the work itself, and the jealousy, her tears. For me, it was another Madame Valentino story unfolding altogether. So from the sands of the Valley of the Kings, 
and the dark, cool passageways of the tomb of the great pharaoh, Ramses VI. This story unfolds. Natasha first traveled to Egypt with her second husband, Alvaro, in the 1930s, didn't she? As she did. Uh, and this was her first visit, and I think from that moment on she knew this was her destiny. On her trip with Alvaro, she met the great Egyptologist Howard Carter, who discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun. She wrote how she wept with emotion, being in the land of the Nile. And she felt she had lived there long before, perhaps in a previous life. You know, she was not so alone in her assessment of herself as some queen of the Nile. Valentino's close friend and trusted business manager, George Ullman, wrote in his memoir, and I quote from Beyond Valentino, page 423, Cleopatra is her greatest prototype in history. In fact, if I believed in reincarnation, I could very easily imagine that the soul of Natasha Rombova, with all of her physical perfections and her mysterious fascination, had once inhabited the body of Egypt's queen, and that the Nile and its desert sands had once been her natural habitat. End quote. Natasha would organize her next trip to Egypt in February of 1947. Uh, which was funded by the Bollingen Foundation, and it was on that trip she first met Alexander Pienkov. She first met the imposing Alex in the library of the French Institute of Archaeology in Cairo. Mark Hasselrus thinks this took place around the end of 1947, and reportedly the two spoke for hours in what was described as an animated conversation. That conversation was the beginning of what would be 20 years of collaboration, and as I would learn in reading their letters, theirs was a relationship which exceeded their business collaboration. Theirs was a relationship where she held his power of attorney, where she managed his finances, and where she was in possession of the only copy of his will, and where she had sole access to his various U.S. bank accounts. I had to think how perplexed, shall we say, Mrs. Piankoff would have logically been to know that this beautiful Egyptologist Natasha Rambova had so much power in her husband's personal life. But more about that messy situation in a bit. Now, after Natasha Rambova's 1947 Bollingen-funded trip to Egypt, uh, in 1948-49, with her assistance and connections, Alexander Pienkov was awarded a grant, a huge grant, uh, from the Bollingen Foundation, with which he would fund a full-scale expedition into the Valley of the Kings, to record the inscriptions on the entire tomb of Ramses VI, and also transcribe the golden shrines of King Tutankhamun in Cairo, an ambitious endeavor by any measure. Now, Alexander Pienkov promptly appointed Natasha Rombova in charge of everything, absolutely everything, concerning his prestigious expedition. So, this was when she hired Mark Aceres, yes? Uh, yes, yes it was. Natasha was back in New York City and interviewing to fill several positions, including an expedition photographer and an epigrapher, an epigrapher being a scribe or artist specializing in recording Egyptian hieroglyphs. Enter Mark Castleris. He had just spent the past season on the staff of the Chicago House in Luxor, working with the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago and he was obviously hoping to secure a position with the upcoming Pienkov expedition being led by Natasha Rombova. Mark was promptly hired. He was 25. Natasha was then 52. He would from that day on become her companion, her artist, her epigrapher, and later her student and disciple. I add here that although he has been referred to as Rombova's secretary, he was not. He did not work with her in that capacity, not at all. And I excerpt Beyond Valentino, page 384. And I quote, By October of 1949, the members of the Bollingen Foundation's Egyptian expedition, Natasha Rambova, Alexander Pienkov, Elizabeth Thomas, Mark Hasselrus, and a photographer, L. Fred Hussan, convened at the Mena House near the pyramids. Mark Hasselrus and Fred Hussan were lodged at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute, with Natasha and Elizabeth Thomas in the Luxor Hotel, about a half a mile south of the Oriental Institute. From October until the following March, they recorded and photographed the tomb of Ramses VI in its entirety. According to Alfred Hussan, Natasha and her expedition crossed the Nile River from Luxor on a barge each morning, 
with Natasha's small dog in tow, where she would set up near the entrance of the tomb to do her work. By April of 1950, the recording of the tomb was complete, and the move was made to Cairo for work on the golden shrines of the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Additional field work took place in Saqqara, south of the pyramids of Giza, as Hussan uh, wrote, and I quote, In addition to the above-mentioned assignments, we photographed parallel religious texts in several other tombs in the Valley of the Kings. The expedition was not without tension, and on several occasions Natasha grew short-tempered. Pienkov would later blame Fred Hussan and Elizabeth Thomas's departures from the expedition on Natasha's Irish temper. Natasha was livid when she discovered Fred Hussan was exhibiting a montage of his photographs in the Oriental Institute at tea break. She demanded he remove the, the photographs as they belonged to the expedition and were not for public display. Mark Hasselrus nearly left the expedition, but Natasha made her amends, acknowledging his eloquent criticism of her behavior with a box of chocolates. Alexander Pienkov intervened in the role of peacemaker between Natasha and her young artist, and Mark agreed to remain in Egypt for the final months of work. He wrote his letter of grievances to Natasha and then wrote his family in March of 1951, lamenting he was, quote, finished with this type of work. He added, Egypt is a strain on the system and in time it attacks the health of its visitors, end quote. Now in his letters to Michael Morris, Mark Hasselrath reveals more about the dynamics of this colorful expedition. And I quote from a letter he wrote to Michael Morris on November 8, 1986. Natasha had a good relationship with Alexander Pienkov. She had in all probability read some of his translations in the original French before she met him, one day in the library of the French Institute in Cairo. The date may have been the late fall of 1946 or the winter of 47. Whenever they talked, it was in animated interest. Natasha respected and liked Pienkov, and he respected her. They did not always agree about the symbolism or Egyptian religious ideas, end quote. And another uh, selection from another letter he wrote to Michael, he writes, and I quote, Natasha and I were in Luxor, near the end of our work there, and were both tired and nervous. She'd been quite a taskmaster with me after Fred Hussan's departure uh, some time before, for Fred had completed his wonderful photographs, and we were at the end and perhaps let down from the completion of the work. We had words, and she decided not to have me do color diagrams she had wanted for the Book of Caverns. I remained at Chicago House, she at the Luxor Hotel, and for some days we did not communicate. Then one day I arrived for a previously scheduled class on symbolism, which Dr. Pienkov attended when he was in Luxor, uh, and Natasha was crestfallen when she answered the door. She was surprised to see me. She was not up to giving a class. She had, I thought, been crying. Was I to blame? I didn't know, but I thought so. I'd sent her a sharp letter, perhaps a week or less before. These details are vague regarding the timing. It was actually just a storm in a teacup. End quote. Now I add here that most of the content of those letters Natasha wrote as reports of her work to the Bollingen Foundation, uh, most of it is highly technical. Yet she does write about her travels and her extensive involvement with a few notable dealers in antiquities. When they returned to New York after the expedition, Natasha began working with Alexander Pienkov, publishing the results of their extensive field studies with the Bollingen Foundation's Pantheon Books, who would publish the massive work. This would result in years of Natasha's editing and the publication of the Egyptian Religious Texts and Representations, a multi-volume series of oversized tomes with impressive fold-outs and artwork, much of which was rendered by Mark Hasselrus. Natasha grew impatient with Alex as he consistently, with each volume published, left her name in the role of editor. She wrote to the Bollingen Foundation expressing her wish to quit the project and work on her own thesis, The Cosmic Circuit. As I read about the pienkov rumbova relationship then, I feel he took all the credit for an expedition she primarily organized and the work she completed. Some of the letters from that time frame between Alex and Natasha reveal the tension in their relationship, and I excerpt one dated December 13, 1954, 
uh, from Beyond Valentino, page 421. And I quote, In 1954, The Tomb of Ramses VI was published as Volume 1. The Times Literary Supplements Review expressed doubt whether the general reader had too much information to absorb, while the specialists found too little. Natasha remained displeased with her lack of acknowledgement, and this sparked further rancor with Piankov, and he wrote her in response, quote, You accuse me of dark designs, the crafty Russian, Vizhinsky trying to do in an honest American. Believe me, I never had the attention to get your name out of the title page. I only wanted to explain your part as editor. Not being an Egyptologist, you will get all the blame for my religious speculations. I only wanted to stress in some way that I was the only one responsible for the translations and commentaries. So please, forget the dark man with a beard and a bomb standing around the corner. Now, despite periodic tension, Natasha and Piankov continued their work with the publication of Volume 2, The Shrines of Tutankhamun in 1955. In 1957, Volume 3, Mythological Papyri was published, again edited by N. Rambova. However, this publication included a chapter she authored on the symbolism of the papyri. End quote. Now, during this time, Natasha was living in a country home in Connecticut, where Mark spent a great deal of time. I would argue he lived with her. Some of his comments to Michael Morris in those handwritten letters reveal the arrangement, I guess it could be called, which he had with Rambova. For example, he writes that she went to Europe at one point in the 1950s, and he, and I quote, stayed home with our dogs. I excerpt a few passages from his letters about life with Natasha Rambova, which I feel are insightful about their home life. And some of these comments are listed uh, with even numbers as responses to Michael Morris's questions. Uh, uh, number seven, Natasha was outstandingly even-tempered day by day and year by year. She was temperamental at times, but only regarding certain situations which might bring forth her Irish, as Pienkoff pointed out to me once. She never brooded or was moody, but was emotionally even and stable. She could be critical, but was never sharp, spoke at all times in a soft and even melodious voice, and I never heard her raise her voice even when she was angry, which wasn't often. In answer to question number nine, Natasha used a cane only in Egypt when she came down with a dangly fever, when for a few days she ached all over and didn't know what she had, and perhaps after she got out of the hospital, she was weak from the aftermath of the fever. The next, he has an asterisk next to the word pants, she may have worn them once or twice at home on Carmen Hill in Connecticut, but never outside. In general, she wore suit dresses, jacket, blouse, and skirt. But she also wore dresses both in Egypt and in New York. All of her clothes, when I knew her, were conservative and often businesslike, as she didn't want to stress any association with glamour or Hollywood, especially as she dealt with scholars and Egyptological people. And then he puts the asterisk pants, I mean slacks. Uh, he goes on, Natasha ate a variety of foods until the scleroderma made eating an agony. She liked Japanese food, Chinese food, and old American food in Egyptian dishes, just about everything well prepared. Natasha never mentioned any allergies, but she said that if, she, if anyone had sinus trouble, the only starch they should eat was rice. Natasha was not accident prone. I have known many people who were. She never had a migraine to my knowledge. In 1960 or 61, Natasha already had difficulty in swallowing. I was told after she died, she had a tumor in her throat. And one day we sat in her enclosed porch, and we ate crushed caviar, the only thing she said she could eat. At a sumptuous veal roast dinner, I would have to force myself to eat in her presence, both to please her and Mrs. Reardon, our Norwegian cook. He writes, Natasha's sense of humor was never of the guffaw type. I never heard her roar at anything, however funny. But once she told me that when she answered the phone, her parrot would say, hello, with a lilt. And as she told me, she chuckled, for it had exposed her mannerism to herself and held up to the mirror to reality, and she saw it as a society veneer. Her smile was the most beautiful smile I have ever seen. It is true I was a hero worshipper of her at that time, but her Irish eyes were a wonder when she smiled. It was one particular moment 
in the woman's exchange restaurant, when apparently I said something, and what I shall never be able to recall, which amused and also pleased her. I wish I could recall, but I can't. She smiled so radiantly that I was bowled over, so to speak. I shall carry that image to my grave. It is quite impossible to convey such a thing. And a last mention in this letter, which I found interesting, and I quote, Now I realize Natasha was at times controversial, and I will not gainsay it. She could be. Posterity has to view a life and evaluate it by its own standards, and according to the information available to it. However, the young Natasha was, as far as I can determine, quite different in certain respects from the mature Natasha, end quote. Now, one of the most revealing comments Mark Hasselrus makes is his telling Michael Morris that a movie made in 1954 in Egypt titled The Valley of the Kings, in Technicolor, uh, was based on his and Natasha Rombova's story. He points out that Robert Taylor's character in the movie is even named Mark, and Eleanor Parker, he felt, was a very true portrayal of Natasha Rombova. And that movie, many parallels to her Egyptian work were made. And if this movie is a story based on Mark and Natasha's time together on that expedition, then they were perhaps secret lovers. As in the movie, Natasha Rombova's character has a torrid and secret love affair with the lead male character played by Robert Taylor, Mark. Apparently, Michael Morris read... Uh, or had heard that Natasha threatened to sue the producer of the movie. Uh, and Mark writes to Michael Morris responding, I saw the film. Eleanor Parker played her part as a Natasha to Robert Taylor as a Mark in a film called The Valley of the Kings, where the lady is searching for the tomb of Joseph. Some of the props were from the film The Egyptian by Mika Waltari, and it was an intrigue and murder mystery. I thought the coincidental names odd, to say the least. I didn't know Natasha threatened to sue the filmmakers. She never mentioned the incident to me at all. End quote. I add that the entire movie, The Valley of the Kings, is available on YouTube, and watching it in this light is fascinating, and I think it's an oddment of old Hollywood and Natasha Rombova's story. Why do you think so little is known about Natasha Rombova and Mark Aceres? Uh, well, I guess he had to assume the role of employee or student, because in the 1950s, a woman of her age uh, with a man 27 years younger would have been seen as horribly scandalous. Now, we know Natasha Rombova was not a woman to abide by society conventions, but she had her limits. Mark maintained his discreet and respectful position in her story and in her daily life, it appears. Now, Natasha's fiery relationship with Alexander Pienkov would not really diminish even though she did resign from working on his books to work on her own thesis. In 1964, he would dedicate his tome, titled The Litany of Ray, to her. Natasha Rombova was then angry and disappointed with Pienkov, as his letter to the Bollingen Foundation in advance of the publication of the book reveals. He writes, and I quote beyond Valentino, page 436. Uh, this is from a letter Alexander Pienkov writes to the Bollingen Foundation president on October 10, 1962. The peace offering has been received, and a letter of thanks reached me a few days ago. I still do not know what are the reactions to the frontispiece affair, and hope that the tempest will not be directed at you. Speaking of the frontispiece, have you decided whether there will be one or not? If yes, I suggest the Memtuemhat plate. I think your suggestion is excellent. Let me dedicate the Litany of Ray to Miss Rombova. End quote. In 1966, Natasha Rombova would be spending her last few months of life in a nursing home in Pasadena, California. She was transferred there after she was found unconscious in a hotel in New York. With the scleroderma making it almost impossible for her to eat, she grew weak in the final stages of the terminal disease. She was given electric shock treatments, which Mark tried desperately to prevent. And her two cousins, Ann Wollen and Catherine Peterson, arrived from California to take her back there with them. She would have one personal item uh, in her room in that nursing home, a ceramic tile made for her by Mark of his drawing of Anubis, the jackal-headed Egyptian god of death in the afterlife. Natasha Rombova died on June 5, 1966. And one month later, Alexander Piankov died 
while walking on a street in Brussels. And I excerpt Beyond Valentino, page 422. Uh, and I quote, One month later, on July 20th, 1966, Alexander Pienkov died of a heart attack while visiting a family in Brussels. As Pienkov had never transacted the transfer of his New York bank accounts, his wife, Helena, was left without funds in Paris. A frantic search for Natasha's lawyer ensued, as she had been the only person in possession of Pienkov's last will and testament and all documentation regarding his financial holdings. The details of Madame Pienkov's dire situation were revealed in a correspondence between Maud Oaks and Von Gilmore at the Bollingen Foundation, end quote. Now, perhaps this was when and how Mrs. Pienkov learned of Natasha Rumbova's deep involvement in her husband's affairs. But the frantic search for access to Alex's uh, bank accounts was documented in letters within the Bollingen file. Mark Hasselis would live for another 30 years and act as disciple of Natasha Rumbova, lecturing about her work and teaching in the School of Sacred Arts in New York. Uh, and in the school brochure, instructor Mark Hasselrus is cited as having served as artist draftsman for the epigraphic survey at Kansu and Medinet Habu Temples for the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. As an artist in the Bollingen Foundation expedition, he recorded the great tomb of Ramsey VI and the shrines of Tutankhamun. As art advisor to the Bollingen Foundation, he has illustrated such works as Mythological Papyri of the 21st Dynasty, The Great Litany of Ray, Dale Saunders' Mudra on Japanese ritual hand gestures, and Joseph Campbell's The Mythic Image. Now, he would conduct courses in e Egyptian hieroglyphic painting and sacred arts. He would illustrate many books, write, and continue to produce his spiritual art, some of which, thanks to his nephew, is included in Beyond Valentino. Mark would live the last years of his life with Dorothy Norman, photographer, writer, and social activist. Now, Dorothy Norman was the mistress of photographer Alfred Stiglitz, and she died in 1997 while living with Mark. Uh, as I mentioned, Mark passed away in 1999. How do you think the revelation of her life with Mark Hasheris and Alex Piankov had insight into her relationship with Rudolf Valentino? Well, Mark wrote in one letter, which I found relevant, the following comment about Natasha Rombova, and I quote, There had been more than one man who fell on his face before her, however, because of her presence and her extraordinary beauty. Uh, her ladylike elegance, poise, and almost, at moments, royal aura is hard to duplicate. She was somehow royal. When her beauty went, she still had that incredible radiance. Now, for me, Natasha Rambova definitely had a bewitching presence, as George Ullman once wrote, and I cite Beyond Valentino, page 97. I quote, To achieve her success, Mrs. Valentino obtained the services of some of the greatest geniuses of the profession, one and all. I saw these men pass under the spell of her personality and yield up to her the greatest treasures of their art. This brings me to the subject of this woman's amazing fascination. Not only was her taste in dress an eye-arresting thing, oriental, exotic, sometimes bizarre, but her costumes invariably added to the almost sinister fascination she was able to exert whenever she chose, end quote. I think it's interesting that Allman chose to use the adjective sinister, uh, but he makes some relevant, uh, relevant points to this discussion. Natasha had the ability to captivate with her beauty and stature, and I think this is exactly what happened to Rudolf Valentino. Although when he and Natasha fell in love, he was not a major star at all, so the power uh, she was attracted to in him was, in my opinion, physical and intellectual. I also think that in analyzing her lifetime of loves and male interests, she did recognize and was attracted to genius. This certainly resulted in a great deal of sorrow and grief for her. For example, Theodore Kosloff shot her, for God's sake. Uh, but we see Natasha, over her lifetime of relationships with these powerful men, to always have a creative endeavor in progress with them. Did she perceive love as an artistic collaboration? With Alvaro, they restored and built villas on Mallorca and designed lighting for a system of caves. And there's some great photos of those caves in Beyond Valentino, by the way. 
and with Svetislav Rurich, she planned a school of religion and philosophy. She was attracted to ambitious men who would also see in her, uh, I am sure, a great advantage. I think she enjoyed their company, their professional partnerships, and intellects, and she sure did not fall for bland men with small personalities. Now, in Hollywood in the 1920s, as Rudolph Valentino's wife, she faced absolutely insurmountable opposition to her presence in his career. Yet it is interesting to me to realize that at the time she and Valentino divorced, she held the power over all of his studio contracts. She was the sole stockholder of the, his corporate alter ego, Cosmic Arts, a business entity which technically owned his contracts just as she would hold this same power over Alexander Pienkov. Natasha Rumbova was a woman who managed to actually gain the legal upper hand in a relationship. Natasha's work ethic certainly becomes a dominant aspect of her personality, which is a trait revealed throughout those last prolific decades of her life. Despite her rather fragile health and her last years battling a terminal illness, she seemed tireless and, I could say, even driven in her endeavors. This is something Ullman also wrote about, saying she could work for hours without a pause. But as much as we can attribute these seemingly calculating aspects of her love life, we have to recall what Mark Hasselrus said about her smile. Men fell, as he said, on their faces over her. Natasha Rambova had her heart broken several times, and she seemed remarkably easy to break up with. Rudolph Valentino sent her packing. More about that in our episode on their divorce. Svetislav Rurich left her in New York and went home to mother in India. And Alvaro, who knows really, he did eventually tell her he had fallen in love with another woman. Pienkov was married, but left her in control of his personal affairs. And only Mark would remain devoted to her for the rest of his life. Would Natasha be remembered today if she had not married Rudolf Valentino? That's the question. I, for one, think not so much. She would have been a footnote as a set designer or art director on a few silent films. I have to admit it was more than a bit depressing for me to research the scholars of the Bollingen Foundation, Natasha's colleagues, those who devoted their lives to academic field pursuits and their publications of their work funded by the Bollingen Foundation. Most of those names have all been bit forgotten. Maud Oakes, who recorded the language of the Navajo, Elizabeth Thomas, Egyptologist, and others. I think had Natasha Rambova not been Rudolph Valentino's controversial wife, she would be among those forgotten scholars. And I absolutely recommend the book Bollingen, An Adventure in Collecting the Past by William McGuire. What a mind-boggling book. This incredible and well-written history of the Foundation and its scholars I think should be required reading. What these people contributed was vast and to now be barely remembered. Uh, and by the way, William McGuire knew Michael Morris, and he wrote me a great letter in the last days of his life, which I treasure. So the resolution of Rambova's loves, Valentino's tragic death, her marriage to Alvaro, ending officially in an annulment some years later. She never committed to Alexander Piankov, obviously, and her relationship with Mark Hasselrus, well, it remains an enigma. Did she have a type of man? Yes, I think she did. Foreign, in the very least. Three Russians... Koslov, Rurich, and Piankov, an Italian, Valentino, the Spaniard, Alvaro, and Mark Hasselrus, who is of Danish descent. I think Natasha Rambova's true power was in her sex appeal, obviously. These were not men to be swept away solely by intellect. These were all men with huge egos and no doubt libidos. We find a clue to this side of Natasha Rambova's sexy lady appeal in another letter, which is published in The True Rudolph Valentino by Balthasar Kuei. This is a letter written by Natasha to Valentino and written while she was in that enforced exile in her stepfather's summer home in upstate New York. More about this in Affairs Valentino. Rudolph Valentino gave this letter to Balthasar Kuei uh, personally to include in the book. And this brief and passionate message says so much. And I quote the true Rudolph Valentino, page 84. Uh, you do not know how the strain exhausts me, Natasha writes. It's so hard. And it seems that I'm going from bad to worse. Instead of correcting myself, despite what I do. Nor does it ever leave me the fear that this will separate us in the end. 
if you could hurry up and come before it's too late. Try to have a little patience, and I will also try to master myself as best I can. My imagination seems to always be active and exaggerating, and I cannot stop it. I anxiously await your letter telling me of your plans. I hope that this time we can make them. Things are getting so discouraging. That's all for now, my life. I must close, because A is waiting to take the correspondence. All my love is for you, little boy. If I did not love you, I would not be so excited, nor would it excite you either. But I cannot manage life without you. A million kisses of love and tenderness. Your naughty little doll. End quote. Well, Rudolph Valentino's naughty little doll had her wiles, which proved effective and provided her with a lifetime of loyalty and attention. For today, I leave Natasha Rabova in Egypt, and I read her conclusion to that lengthy letter to Jack Barrett at the Bollingen Foundation, and I quote, Last evening, I drove back from Karnak at sundown along the banks of the Nile. Looking across to the foothills beyond, there was one continuously moving picture filled with opalescent light and veils of deepening mist shading from violet to indigo. Here you move in a land of silent mystery, not of this world. Yet there to be read by those who can, a land which has seen the far distant past and its greatest glories and will remain to see the distant future all unmoved. The only other country which has the same quality of eternity and cosmic space is Arizona. No wonder the myths of Egypt are all of cosmic gods. And their designs, the sublime conceptions of minds ever dwelling in the nearness of far-off worlds. The stars at night hang in the sky like friendly and familiar lamps one can reach up, touch, and become part of as they light the way. But enough, as this report seems to have run away with itself again. Best wishes as ever, Natasha Rambova. I want to today, as always, in closing, thank everyone who supports our work, who write and send materials and for, for use in these episodes. And I also want to encourage people to read our books, which are all available online, and more can be found out about them on affairsvalentino.com and rudolphvalentino.org. These books are a result of a great deal of research and discovery, and I am always eager to share them. And for today, as always, I say, Fiat Justitia Ruat Celum. And for the good, good guys, Arrivederci.